Welcome to CXO Talk 856. I'm Michael Krigsman, and we're exploring AI and data science. What works, what doesn't, and what fails. Our guests are two prominent chief data scientists. Dr. Satyam Priyadarshi is the former chief data scientist and technology fellow at Halliburton and is currently CEO of Reignite Future. And Dr. Anthony Scrifignano is the former chief data scientist at Dun & Bradstreet, and he's now a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center. Anthony, business leaders somehow think that AI is magic and can deliver instant results. And we, and users, you know, we think that too. What do you say about that as a data scientist? There's nothing new about most of what's going on right now, except that we have a lot more compute power and a lot more data. Along comes something that mimics the behavior of humans sufficiently that we start to like it. It's easier to talk to. It's easier to understand the answers that we get back. And it becomes more popular to the masses. And that's a good thing in some ways, but that's also a very dangerous thing. We have to be very careful. There's a reason why we need prescriptions for certain drugs in the in the pharmacy because if used incorrectly, bad things happen. It's the same kind of situation. What about the relation between AI and data? You know, it's obvious everybody knows that you need data to run your AI, but how is that working? Are there hidden problems inside organizations that don't necessarily come to the surface, not because you data scientists are trying to hide anything, but God knows if you wanted to, you could. No, in practice, data scientists don't hide anything. They, they will tell the story what the data tells. Whatever data they have stored, little or small or big or large, whatever the term they want to use, the models will actually present a, 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 a pattern that will actually tell a story. And that story is sometimes bothers business leaders because when I say that these many of these leaders have been sitting on inefficiencies for decades and the data tells that story and then they said, oh, no, 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 you can't say that. You are a data scientist, not a subject matter expert. How can you say that? But, you know, data never comes like uh, uh, And data will pick up uh, anything that uh, has been modified or has been changed. And uh, it will show up in the story or the pattern that we are creating. And uh, that is the reason why people will say we don't have data. We have less data. We have bad data, high, low quality data. But then if you look at many of the complex industries, they have been collecting data for decades. So why are they not using it? Right. I, so that's a challenge. There's a number of challenges that we all have. And, and whether this is data science or, or anything that involves analytics, um, you run into something called confirmation bias, which is, you know, I believe something to be true. Go look in the data and find the data that supports what I believe to be true. And if you look in enough data, you'll find something that supports anything you think is true. And so if you ask a bunch of data scientists without any understanding and without any involvement with them in the work they're doing and the assumptions they're making, the data doesn't care how you feel. It's going to give you an answer. But then the people who believe they knew the truth before they asked the question start pushing back and saying, that can't be the answer. And, you know, go work harder. And if you torture the data long enough, it will, it will confess to anything you want. So we have to be very, very careful about what's called the a priori assumptions, the assumptions that come up before you enter into any analytic process. You have to believe that the data you're looking at is representative of the frame you're projecting it into. You have to believe that data that was true is still true. You even have to believe that you're, you have the provenance, you know where you got the data, that you're allowed to use that data to answer that question. There's a lot of work that has to be done before you push that AI button. What I find is really interesting is this notion of a story, that the, the data is telling a story. And so can we pull on that thread? And Satyam, you said earlier that there's, there's nothing to hide, and we hear about all you know issues around problematic data, not enough data, yet companies have so much 
data. So can we can we pull on that a little bit, this notion of the of the story that the data tells? One of the most common thing that we hear people talk about application of AI algorithms is in predictive maintenance, right? Very important for pretty much any complex industry, manufacturing, oil and gas, energy, wind, whatever, whichever you want to pick there is, right? Now, if you have been collecting some data, whether it is 30% good or 40% good and incomplete or complete to an extent, uh, you will build a model on that. Uh, your algorithm, it will show you a story. Correct? It will tell you some pattern will come and it will tell you a story. Now, goal is, can I actually convert this data into a smart data? That means if there are gaps in the data because you don't believe what the data tells the story is not what fits in your brain because you think that you are an expert, then you tell us why the pattern has come. And if it requires more, uh, it requires more data sets, then you need to collect more data. And if you cannot, if uh, you need to be enhance that data, and then actually can actually explain all the aspects of that predictive maintenance. And that story is that basically you are taking uh, uh, incomplete data and making the data smart so that you can actually take advantage of the full self-learning models. Imagine what happened in the airline industry during COVID when all the airplane, all the flights were pretty much shut down for a long period of time. Imagine you had a bunch of models that were trying to predict when certain aircraft were going to need certain types of maintenance and when certain MRO, like uh, uh, greases and oils and screws and nuts and bolts, when these things were in, needed to be ordered, the distribution management systems that predict when those things will be delivered. None of those were working right because the, the underlying behavior changed in a way that wasn't represented in the longitudinal data that was used by those systems to make those predictions. Some smart people had to say, hold on, we need some adult supervision here. The assumptions in these models are no longer valid and we can't just use these models to do all of those things, distribution and ordering and, and scheduling and maintenance and hiring of mechanics. All of that has to be rethought in the context of this disruption. In the middle of that disruption of COVID, there's a ship stuck in the middle of the Suez Canal that had nothing to do with COVID, right? And now people are shipping things by air that they weren't shipping by air because they were shipping them by sea. And now all of a sudden, now we need more flights, right? So you have to stay on top of the situation. You can't just let these things run amok. Context is very important. Most people forget about it, that uh, whatever data we look at as data scientists, we know that we know the we know the context. But how does this come about and how can business leaders and technology leaders interrupt that negative cycle of using data for the wrong purposes and getting results that are substandard or even meaningless results? One of the things that, that happens in aerospace, I'll just use this as an example, uh, it's a good example. When a, when a rocket is going to launch, uh, you don't have one system deciding whether or not that rocket launches. You have multiple systems that kind of vote on whether or not the launch should happen. And the smarter ones use different criteria to reach that conclusion. So one of the ways that you can guard yourself against the kind of concerns that you're articulating, Michael, is to have multiple systems that are observing the same environment, the same decisioning from different perspectives, or even from the same perspective, but isolated equipment and so forth, to make sure that we aren't running into some surprise situation. You know, the, the old joke in, back in, you know, long ago, you used to have these commercials that said, nine out of 10 dentists surveyed, recommend, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, if you if you pick the right 10, you'll find nine of them that say what you want them to say. That doesn't make it true. So um, you do want to have systems that are uh, representative, that are looking at a lot of data and possibly not informing each other so that they don't all have to be wrong in order for you to be wrong. Please subscribe to our newsletter. Go to cxotalk.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Gus Beckdash on Twitter says... Data science slash AI is similar to statistics where questions can illuminate or mislead. That's why the right questions are important. 
He says the real question is what should data scientists do to number one, ask the right questions, and number two, and this is interesting, deal with the politics that are bigger than them. So, so now, I, yeah, I love please. this question. Yeah, I love this question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I always have trouble doing that, but um, it, it's it's so such an important question. So two parts, two predicates, right? First, what can you do to ensure that you're asking the right questions? There's a whole science called propositional calculus that starts with, you know, what do you have to believe? What are the things that will be axiomatically considered to be true that we're not going to test? What are the things you're trying to test? What is the method that you think you're going to use to test it? And by what right do you use that method? What are the, the assumptions built into that method? All of those things have to happen. The science of this is, yes, it is just math, but it's not just any math. So as an example, we're talking a lot about things that are regressive or supervised, where you can look at data from the past and sort of build a, an equation that predicts the future based on looking at the past. It's totally a party foul to try to use regressive methods in the context of disruption, because now the future doesn't look like the past anymore. So you have to consider the elasticity that's introduced by that disruption before you can do it. So the math guys are very important, but then that political dimension comes in, the second predicate. And what you have to do there is you have to assess a number of things. Number one, you have to assess the, you know, you can be right and dead, right? So um, if very powerful people are insisting that you reach the wrong conclusion, um, that that's more of a moral question or an ethical question than it is a, a data science question. But we all face those things in the workplace. And I'm sure, Satyam, you've had more than your share of that, um, given where you've worked. You know, lots of pressure to give the answer that all those higher-ups want. Um, you know, we have to find ways, and you get you lose enough hair and you get old enough, and you find ways to say, you know, from my perspective and my experience, from what I see, at, or, you know, it, it it appears to me so that when they're upset with you, you know, they can be upset, but they can't be upset with how you feel because how you feel is how you feel. There are ways to deliver these messages, but you have to get pretty good at advocacy and ethics if you want to really do the real science here. Otherwise, you'll be right and dead. In my practice, um, last 20 years, not just the last job, but last 20 years, I have always talked about what the data tells of the story. I believe I define data science as science on the data. Right. It could be just using simple statistics. It could be using data mining. It could be using machine learning algorithms. Whatever the method is, my goal is to figure out value for the business and whatever works. Not everything requires neural networks and not every uh, not everything can be solved with simple statistics. So we have to look at the business problem that we are talking about and actually build build the solutions accordingly and look at what value proposition it gives, whether it is the cost savings or it is uh, increase in sales, whatever the num uh, metric you might to use, financial metrics that can speak to the leadership. Uh, I don't, I have never basically taken directions on leaders that this is the answer they want. Uh, I t in fact, when I hired my data scientist, I will tell them that, tell the story what the data tells, we have, have a thick skin, the domain expert should explain why that result came uh, or from this data. And if they can't explain, then they need to go back to the drawing board. Uh, we are not making any, we are not actually telling data anything. We are make, we are looking at the data and telling you what it is. And hence, um, uh, yes, there is, there is a political aspect to it. I think the political aspect is among the people uh, at the leadership that they can't agree on it. I think with data scientists, they can only say, oh, your results are not what I expected. Then you explain what, what the results are. So would it be correct to say then that the technology and the data enable you to arrive at certain conclusions? And that is the story that the data tells. The next step, which is using that information, the results of that story, in order to make decisions. Well, decisions are based on the data and decisions may be based on external factors such as politics, but that's very distinct from the data story itself. Is that, Satyam, a correct way of describing it? Right. If you, if you make decisions based on data, then you have something to show for. 
But if you say, okay, I, I ignore the results from a data uh, analysis, let's call it a word in quotes, uh, and then you want to do whatever your experience says, uh, then there could be, there could be uh, what should I call uh, um, rocks in the or in your glass as well, right? Uh, but at the same time, uh, um, you know, like uh, uh, if you look at where the challenges happen, right? I give you one one more example. When the when the leaders don't really understand what it is all about, so think of two leaders from two different organizations working on it, and they build a model on a certain set of data, right? And then model was great. Uh, with great accuracy, but the uh, but leader B says, no, no, now take this model and run it on a data set C and the result doesn't come out. They don't even, they did not compare what is the drift in the data, said, oh, you're, what the model you built is not useful, but they actually gave completely a different data from a different context, even though it was similar problem. Now that data drift can cause serious issues. And then they will say, oh my God, what happened, right? And then they will abandon the project and that becomes the statistics on why AI projects fail. And then I have to assume that they come back to the data scientists and say, hey, you gave me the wrong data, the wrong results. Absolutely. <laughs> they will say that you gave us the wrong model. That is true. Just, so just uh, uh, wait. Wait till the day after the election and 50% of the people will be doing exactly that, right? Let's go to another question now from Twitter. This is from TH Go, who says, with a background in different industries where the popularity of AI technologies are growing, what do you think the impact of decision-making, especially about predictive analytics will be? Anthony? predictive analytics and decision-making? In the future, we're going to pay as much attention to analytics, right? Are we going to just make decisions uh, because AI told us to, or are we going to make decisions because we feel like it? Um, these things become more and more part of the, the ether that we live in, and then we stop questioning how they work or why they work. So I think moving forward, we have to be very, very careful that we're not creating a generation of people that just accept how things work, accept that they work, don't question whether or not they may be right. Uh, when I took my first um, physics class, the calculators existed, but we had to take the class, got to take the class using slide rules only. And you know everybody was complaining, what is this? Well, what that is, is it forces you to think in your head about how many zeros, where's the decimal point in the answer? you know, 16% of 47 million can't be more than 47 million. And nowadays we, we are at risk of just pushing the button and saying, well, there's the answer, 93 million, right? Um, you, it's very important that we understand what we're doing and why we think it should work. There's a great example of uh, what Satyam was talking about that happened. There's two different versions of this story. One happened during the Korean War. One happened during the Second World War. It doesn't matter which war it was. A bunch of really smart people were analyzing why pilots got shot down. And, you know, the, the survival rate for pilots during both of those wars was pretty scary. Um, and so they, they don't know what the answer is. So they start looking at all the different factors, the training of the pilots and the nature of the mission and the amount of extra ordnance that they had and so on and so forth. And sooner or later, because you don't know which factors are important, someone starts to look at where the bullet holes were and the planes that came back. And the conclusion, the decision they made was put more reinforcement in these airplanes in these places where they're getting shot. We have these bullet holes. There they are in the wings. Put more, more reinforcement in the wings. Well, you, the plane gets heavier and heavier, and then you can carry less, and it's more difficult to fly. Eventually, somebody had the brilliant observation that you're only looking at the planes that came back, not the ones that got shot down. And where the bullet holes are is where they were able to survive and get back. So let's put the arming armament where the bullet holes aren't. And it turns out more people survived, not because of AI, not because of analytics, because of somebody asking a better question. And we need to train people to think analytically like that and not just say, how many bullet holes are there per square inch in different parts of the plane? And let me go to the one that has the highest density of bullet holes, because that's mathematically defendable and absolutely wrong. 
you're trying to get people to actually think and understand. You're yes. causing a causing a lot of people a lot of work. Sorry, too bad. <laughs> Because this isn't supposed to be easy and nobody really cares how hard it is. Boo hoo. Except the people who you're causing this extra work to who do care. They love it. But it's about leadership. Seriously, it's about how you position that, right? If you just say, look, Michael, I'm going to ask you to do something and it's 10 times harder than it could be. And, and let me know when you're done. Of course, you're going to hate it. Uh, but if if I am a good leader and if I can help you understand the value of doing it this way, Notice before I said had to take, and then I changed it to got to take, right? It's all about how you think about that challenge. This is from Arsalan Khan on Twitter. Arsalan asks great questions. And he says this, sometimes management use consultants to justify their own agenda. For example, reducing full-time equivalents, FTEs, business process re-engineering, politics. Is AI any different? As a professor, I say AI is just a, a subject uh, which talks about mimicking human intelligence, machines that will mimic human intelligence. But in the marketing terms, we use AI as a technology. So let's uh, we'll keep that term for now. Uh, but in some sense, AI is not same as uh, way of distractions that is caused by hiring consultants and others for their agendas. AI AI, speed, AI works on the data and data tells a story, which is unless data is manipulated by human beings, the data will tell the right story. And if, in fact, the, the most powerful, I look at it is the application of AI. When you look at data, it is to augment what we as human beings cannot figure out uh, of a process of a workflow. But uh, building algorithms can help you figure out that gap or that inefficiency that is there, and we can actually convert, uh, transform the business accordingly. And that is where the most powerful power of uh, power of AI is in that sense. So that's it is it is actually in the benefit of the leaders to use it correctly and uh, fast. I know leaders, and I'm sure we all do, who say I have great respect for you data scientists and for your PhDs and your expertise, your knowledge and your models. But the results that you are giving me are not what I need. And not only that, they're wrong. And I have to do what I have to do. My answer to such leaders is that it's time to move on because then your <laughs> business cannot be transformed. If you really want to live in the era of Industry 4.0 and 5.0, you are not the right leader for it. But why? Explain that. Ex ex explain that. Look at the podcast that you are doing, how many different technology you are using, and you are actually uh, improving the quality of the sound, your qual quality of the video. Uh, you could not have done that with a simple uh, wired headphone, right? If you really wanted a high quality podcast, you want to actually leverage the technology. And if you don't, then who will come to your podcast? If the mature technology is there and it has proven value in many places, then it is time for you to leverage that technology or the solutions of that technology so you can actually build a res uh, resilient business which is sustainable in the coming era when the market dynamics is changing, global market is changing, and, and the uh, expectations of the consumers are changing. This question is one that, that I've seen Arsalan Khan ask numerous times in different forms. He's a regular listener of the show, which again is this question of data science, scientists produce results, and I'm the business person, and you guys are wrong. Sorry. First of all, I'm the business person too, right? So it's not we and they. We're both pushing the same rock up the same hill. So I I, I really, Michael, you know, if you were my, my counterparty, I, I want to be on the same side of the table as you. I am, we're both part of the business, um, but I'll, I'll suspend that offense for a minute because I know you didn't mean it that way. Um, what I usually do with this, I, I, you know, I have a different approach than Satyam, which I, I'm, I have to say I'm jealous of your response. And I would probably feel, love to say that to people from time to time, but I don't. Um, I'm a student of martial arts. And one of the things that they teach you is when you have an opponent, 
who is much stronger than you, especially if they have a weapon, if you just try to fight them, you're going to wind up with a broken arm and you're going to be fighting somebody with a baseball bat. And, you know, that's not as smart, maybe as reaching in and hugging that person, you know, and trying to wrestle with them because now they can't use their baseball bat. Right. So if you try to, to beat me up with saying you're wrong, I, I might say something like, maybe I am help me understand why you think so. You know, maybe, maybe I am wrong. Maybe I didn't understand your question the way I understood your question. This is what the data says. Maybe I didn't understand. Let's talk about it. Right. And, and sometimes that conversation, if I start with the humility of saying, help me understand, even though I kind of think I'm right, if I start with that humility, it, it helps to, to diffuse your tendency to want to hit me with the baseball bat. And it might help you listen to what I'm saying. And maybe we can get to a better place. And by the way, maybe I am wrong. Maybe I didn't understand the question. So, you know, I think we have to we have to talk to each other. We can't be on opposite sides of the table in these situations. Gus Beckdash comes back and he says the following. Okay. He says, Anthony touched on something big. Data science is about using history to predict and shape the future, but there is nothing new in the past. So does data science suppress innovation? He's, and he says it's complicated. And what do you guys, you gentlemen, think about this? Certain types of projection into the future can be informed by looking at the past. And certain other things are of necessity disrupted or never before seen or unprecedented. That doesn't mean that what we learned in the past is useless. It means it's differently useful. And so what we have to be able to do is to, we're talking basically fundamentally about supervised and unsupervised methodologies, right? Supervised means you, you look at training data. You look at the past. Unsupervised generally means you try to look at what you're observing and cluster it and, and organize it in ways that that emerge from the data that you're as you, as you see it as you lay out in front of you it's not that simple there are other methods that sort of stand with one foot in one of those camps and one in the other there's something very valuable in the context of disruption called bayesian inference where you kind of take a little step and then look at things and then take another little step and keep adjusting your your assumptions about what you think is going on but ultimately if you think about the way you drive a car you've learned everything you've learned from all of your years of driving and you certainly have the ability to look in the rearview mirror and see the yellow line behind you. No one would drive their car like that. You always look out the windscreen and you're making decisions in the moment based on what you see and what is presented to you. And so we need methods that are behaving in this way in situations that are very dynamic and very changing, like driving a car. If we're trying to predict the stock market in, in a stable environment, or if we're trying to understand predictive maintenance of equipment that's been in place for a long time and we understand, then please use supervised methods, right? It depends on what, what you're trying to do. Arsalan Khan comes back with this, and he says, when data scientists are too much about the data, do they consider that the data itself can be wrong? Should data scientists explain this caveat to executives before talking about what the AI recommends? As good data scientists or practicing data scientists, we always look at data in the right context, correct? And when you look the data in the right context, it will, uh, it will actually explain the phenomena that we are trying to uh, find inefficiencies in it. And if the data has been tainted or modified or deleted, uh, your story will not complete. And that is what the what the leaders need to know, that you have been wasting money storing the data that is not great. Uh, and there are many, 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 many cases of uh, in all complex industries that the data is being uh, manipulated uh, by one, one person or the other to fit the answer that they were looking for. And those things will show up in when you did a proper modeling on the historical data. Back to the previous question also tie into this. Historical data is critical for learn, understanding what has been done. Without that, we can't build the future models. If anybody thinks that they can, then uh, I think uh, that's completely useless in some sense. That means 
I can build any synthetic data and build a model, but then it will may not be in the right context, right? So that will make, this is where uh, uh, one of the example is that I asked uh, one of the generative AI system, I said, can you make me a flyer for generative AI? And I will, I'll show you those four pictures later that no, the word is learn some AI, not generative AI. It made generative AI word murdered into its uh, into different shapes and sizes. So the thing is, when you are not putting any context, it just says these are just few letters. Let me put them in a different order, right? So we have to be very careful how we do that. And communication with executives is actually the results that have come out of your analysis and showing it to them and saying put it in the right context. This is the context I know, and this you explain why this is happening. Michael, if I can offer uh, a um, another answer to that question th about truth and data, there are some dimensions of truth. I've done a lot of work in, in the science of what's called veracity adjudication, or judging the truthfulness or the usefulness of data for a problem. And I can offer these dimensions. The first one for truth is that when you go to court, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the reason for that, I say this a lot, is because those are three different things. I can tell all, all the truth to allow you to reach the wrong conclusion, and that's a kind of lying, right? I can tell the whole truth, but include a few things that aren't true. That's another kind of lying. And I can, you know, so I can manipulate your, your presumption of what's true. The other uh, dimension, so there's just a few here. Another dimension is representation. Does the data represent the problem? So if you collect, surveys are a great example of this. When you survey a bunch of people and ask them what they think, you have this problem with what's called non-response bias. How, do you, how can you prove that the people you didn't talk to or the people that didn't answer would have answered the same way as the people who did answer? So you have to do some math to prove that your data is representative of the system that you're studying. Unperturbed is another dimension. So we have to be very careful when we use math on systems that are not stable. And especially if somebody may have messed with the data, there's this thing called adversarial manipulation. I don't have to destroy your system. I just have to spoil the milk, like what your AI consumes. Authenticity. Do I know that this data is what it purports to be? A lot of times you can do this with metadata analysis. And then the last one is latency. You know, how old is the data? Data that you collected five minutes ago is not five minutes old. It was created at a certain point. So even if the data passes all of those other tests, it's representative, it's true, it's authentic. It may have all of those, how many people were killed in the earthquake, you know, five minutes ago? And then you look at it, you know, five weeks from now, and many more people were killed in that earthquake because we didn't know about them yet at the time that we had collected that data. So latency is very important. All of those dimensions and many more are important in understanding the veracity and usefulness of data to AI. You ignore them at your own peril. You both do work with very large organizations with very large budgets. In some cases, organizations, uh, consulting companies, for example, spending literally billions of dollars to retrain all of their staff to understand AI. To what extent is this set of data problems pervasive or exist today inside large companies with the assumption that they want to have good data, but they may be making mistakes. I always show a slide, and I, this is based on conversations over the last 15 years, and it continues. Uh, many of these organizations have one very few of them have what is called a data catalog. So they have no idea how much data they really have, correct? So they will say, oh, I have petabytes of data and really ask them where it is, probably no idea. In oil and gas industry, we know that they have multiple copies of the data that has been proven, no recorded, uh, like that. Then most of the people will say that their data is only 40 to 50% complete right, and of bad quality or good quality, depending on who you are asking. So these are very well-known statistics uh, of the data in, in complex industries. But having said that, the, in the last five, I would say five to five years, there has been a lot of changes. People have started learning how to collect data in high frequency, 
collect and then actually analyze it much faster thanks thanks to technologies like iot and cloud that these things have been now improving a lot so uh, in that sense the historical data may be not of the right uh, dim dimensions but still there is a lot to learn but at the same time i think when other associated technologies are helping people change the, their behavior I'll see your brilliant comment and I'll try to raise you at least a smart one. Um, where we, when we started to talk about big data years ago, we talked about these V's, velocity, variety, value, volume. Essentially, we're talking about all of those things now. We're just not using those words. We're talking about big data. Uh, the difference is that now we have devices that operate on the edge. We have self driving cars, we have satellites, we have. All of the data, a hyperspectral sensor package can generate petabytes of data. You can't just beam all of that down to earth. You don't have time. And so you have to make decisions about what you keep and what you what you infer from. Same thing in a car. Uh, the, the cars, the 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 um automate the the self-driving cars, and everybody likes to talk about them even when they're not an expert. I'm certainly not an expert, but the amount of data that they consume is insane. A drone, just a drone, the amount of data that's available to it. All of that data is not being beamed back to the mothership and analyzed by the AI in the mothership. Some of it is, some of it isn't. And in many cases, there's laws about this, there's privacy, there's data localization, there's cross-border data transfer, there's physics, phenomenology, lots of reasons why the data doesn't all live in one place. So in large organizations, yes, they have tremendous corpora of data. Typically, they are very disparate and they are somewhat siloed. There's lots of regulation. And so we don't, as, as large organizations, we don't know everything the organization knows in any one time at any one place. It's, it's very disparate and very democratized around the organization. This would be an excellent time for you to subscribe to the CXO Talk newsletter. Just go to cxotalk.com. You'll see one of those annoying pop-ups that ask you to subscribe. And this way we can notify you about live shows like this. There's a tweet chat taking place on Twitter using the hashtag CXOTalk. On LinkedIn, pop your questions into the chat. And I will say, when else will you be able to ask questions, interrogate, whatever you want to very prominent data scientists? So take advantage of it, folks. Here is a question from Twitter, from a formal question now, from Elizabeth Shaw. And she says, here is a question for Drs. Priyadarshi and Scrifignano. Why augment existing data with synthetic data? What are the implications of using synthetic data? And what happens when do you, or when do you have too much synthetic data? Synthetic data is data that you produce with algorithms that is designed to look like data that has certain aspects. So you might look at all of the data that you have and create lots more of it that looks just like it. Generative AI, in effect, is a massive system that produces synthetic data. If you think about it, the gen in generative AI is making stuff, right? So the world is producing a lot more synthetic data now than it ever did in the history of mankind in the last few years. But on top of that, we have other types of synthetic data. So in a factory setting, for example, you might not have enough testing data to use in a certain algorithm. And you know the, the statistical bounds, upper and lower statistical bounds, and you can produce a bunch of data so that your, your algorithms will work. That's okay. Nothing wrong with doing that. What you have to be careful about in, in many applications is that whatever bias there is in the data that you actually have, that will be amplified in this synthetic data that you produce in one of two ways. Either you'll create more noise and make the anomalies more difficult to see, or you'll create more weird because your data wasn't representative, it was latent, it was any of those things I just rattled off. So you, you should use, I am not anti-synthetic data, I am anti-using synthetic data as a crutch when you don't have enough data and you don't understand what you already have. Synthetic data has a place for sure. Uh, as uh, Anthony just mentioned that uh, if you don't have enough data, but if you understand the physics or the science or, or, or the behavioral aspect of certain 
product services whatever it is then but you don't have enough then you want to create scenario i think in olden days if you call it scenario planning that you can actually leverage the synthetic data for that kind of a scenario planning and saying if this this thing happened this is how it would look like but that doesn't mean that this is the right thing but you have an option now and you can see what what will happen if that kind of data came through uh, in real world so synthetic data can be used very intelligently but within the limits because as uh, anthony mentioned llms are the ones the largest now creating synthetic data uh, if you read what they produce uh, makes in many cases will not make any sense uh, because the way you do you are actually prompting it so that's the same thing in in uh, when you're talking about let's call the numerical data uh, that way it's let's differentiate between the text and the numerical data numerical data within the principles of physics or statistics you can generate and create scenarios then it can be very powerful and can reduce the time for for example uh, one of the companies i advise we are looking at some uh, process which requires looking at uh, an, uh, a similar kind of objects and then differentiating those objects and it's not possible to get all the real data because uh, you have to really sit in a factory to get that so you can actually generate the data build different different models and then you can compare it when you get the real uh, objects in front of you which are flying at a very fast speed and then it helps because now you can see how i can actually differentiate those objects as they are coming in real time so you have actually in you have reduced that time to build a model because now you think of it you have a model now you are actually refining the model with the real data this is again from arsalan khan on the subject of data when is data too much or too little who decides what is too much or too little and then he goes on to say He's sort of veering here. He says, people who decide this would have power, financial decision-making power over others. And what guardrails do we need at the federal level to address this, but not stifle innovation? So let's ask first the technical question of uh, big data versus little data, enough versus too much, sparse data. Anthony, you want to jump in here or, or Sachan, please, whoever. <laughs> there are three types of data. There's the data you have, the data you could reasonably go get, and the data that you know exists that you're never going to be able to get. And so if you think about those three universes of data in context of when do I have enough data, you, it starts to get very interesting. The first way of answering that is you have enough data when the data becomes computable, when the method that you're using can be used to produce an answer. Sometimes this is called dispositive. So there's a threshold, I call it the dispositive threshold. When you have enough data to dispose of the question with the method, that does not necessarily mean you have enough data to make a good decision. It means you have enough data to make a decision. So now imagine you continue to collect data, and at some point, you're not getting any smarter. The predictions that you're making are reasonably stable within a certain statistical limit. At that point, general best practice says you can now publish your answer. You can now give people your answer, give them the degrees of freedom in your answer, and so forth. There is a, a concept of elasticity. How wrong can I be and still make the decision that I'm making? So that has to come into it. Understanding the degrees of freedom. If you're launching a rocket and you're wrong, very expensive, people can die. If you're, I don't know, doing something where there's very low cost of being wrong, marketing maybe, you know, something where you have you can try it and try it over again, maybe it can be a little more wrong. So those kinds of things. Um, but at some point, there's this concept of supersaturation that you're not getting any smarter. And there's this concept of um, dispositive, you know, th that that you can make a decision, but you're not ready to make one yet. And you you got to find the place in between those two. Now, the, the big gotcha here is you have to be very careful about situations where the environment that you're making a decision about 
is changing faster than the data that you're collecting. Because imagine that, the, you know, there's an old Bugs Bunny cartoon where the plane is crashing, you know, and, and they pull the emergency brake right before they crash. There's no emergency brake, right? So if you have situations where you have to make a decision because something else is going to happen if you don't make a decision, there's your dispositive threshold right there. So the world around you can force an answer. Um, those are generally the big, the big uh, rocks in the stream of uh, the statistical methods and the mathematics around decision making and when you have enough data. I'm going to sh- take a breath and, and let Satyam talk. Uh, the the sack part is about guardrails and, and oversight and regulation. Satyam, do you want to jump in here uh, very quickly on this? Because we're going to run out of time and there's a lot left to talk about. So thoughts on, on, on the, this data quantity issue? The way I look at it is that I want the minimal amount of data that will produce the maximum output or the value for my investment, right? Uh, positive value, of course. And uh, so I don't want to really mine uh, a terabytes of data if I can actually build a model with gigabytes of data and less number of features. And But it actually helps me to improve a work, uh, work pro- workflow or a product or a service and gives me the... Uh, return on investment, significant return on investment. That's th- that's how I would think of it in a business world. Uh, in a scientist world, I would think of like, keep looking at it until I run at, 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 a, at an asymptotic limit for the model. Anthony, you grimace. Do you want to, do you have a quick comment on this? That's absolutely the right economic view. Um, you know, I want to use the, the least amount of data to get the most amount of impact. Um, it's almost the opposite of what I said. It's also right. And, you know, both of these things are right. We have to pay for data. We have to pay for people. We have to pay for that. There's a practicality of it. We don't just to go get to go run around being scientists and and people will let us do whatever the right thing is to do at some point. Say, look, we're paying for this data. We're, we're buying it and and it's costing me money. And and I'm looking at you, dude, right? Um, so there is, there is that practical answer as well. This is from Gus Beckdash. When we fed cow remnants to cows, we got mad cow disease. What is the equivalent in AI when AI output is fed as input to AI? I'm not sure whether it's AI output or any. It's a data that goes into the models. So if you are, if you're more, if that more data is not in the right context, then you will not get the right story. So as simple as that. So I would not go into all those uh, kind of details, but it's uh, whatever you are generating from a model you put into a different model, you generate a new model, it will have the uh, story of that data. As Gen AI starts to produce a bunch of output, and then think about Gen AI consuming the output that Gen AI outputs, right? There's a, um, a circling around in this where we're going to get back to you know, amplifying all the biases and and ignoring all of the context and all of that. So we have we the real answer to that question is we don't know yet, but it's happening for sure right now. And if you think about misinformation and disinformation as a great example, um, misinformation is you know when you repeat something that seems to be true because you heard it right and it sounded reasonable, and so you repeated it. Disinformation is when you make up a lie and like put it out there in the ether, right? Well, misinformation and disinformation get amplified at a rate that is hypergeometric with Gen AI because the Gen AI starts to consume it and then it starts to write articles and make posts and do all of those things that seem like they were done by people and they were done by algorithms that contained those mistruths, right? We are living this right now and we don't understand the impact of the disease yet, but I guarantee you that this will become a bigger thing very soon. It, it's already a big thing. When we start paying attention to it, who knows? Are data scientists more prone to publicly dis- or to disseminate, create and disseminate disinformation, misinformation, or confused information? I think data scientists are only about telling story from the data. Telling the That's truth. Safe. Yeah. And if, if that data contains those li- yeah, if that data contains those lies, then then if we're not doing veracity adjudication and all those things I talked about, absolutely, we're we're going to be part of the problem. Okay, my apologies for casting aspersions on data scientists. That was not my intention. The data doesn't care how you feel, Michael. <laughs> now I feel bad. 
<laughs> now I feel insulted. Okay. Uh, very quickly, a uh, question from Huey Wong. And she says, what practical steps can leadership take to foster a data-driven, a data-driven culture within an organization and effectively afford the computing cost? The data-driven culture is going to be very different in a company that makes chewing gum and a company that sells analytics, right? So I think part of that comes from the essence of what the company is about and how data-centric their product or services to begin with. Beyond that, there there is the the background of the leadership in the organization. How dogmatic are they? How how unlikely are they to to embrace the kinds of things that we're talking about here? Ultimately, we're the data sphere, the amount of data that's available on Earth is expanding at a hypergeometric rate. Selling just data, giving people data. Most people have way too much data in their life already. So we have to do much more sense making out of it. So part of that data driven culture is deriving meaningful, actionable insights from that data and making those relevant in the organization so that they fall in love with your data. And then they won't worry about your infrastructure as much because you're adding a lot of value. To uh, what Satyam was saying before, you know, show me the value. Right? He said it better, but that's pretty much the way it is in corporate America. When you discuss these things with leadership, I think it's all about putting in the right context of the business and in, in terms of uh, how, which of the financial metrics is your KPI to implement uh, solutions uh, with, uh, with data-driven solutions. And uh, in that case, uh, you have much better chance that they will buy in the concept and uh, you can actually build an organization around it. A question from Arsalan Khan, another interesting one. I like these. I love these thought provoking questions. He says, with so much data being collected by various organizations, which might be the same as other organizations, why can't we have a central place for all organiz for all data and organizations where all data and organizations, they can just do calls to that data. So why can't we have a central data repository, given the fact that data across so many organizations is so similar in many cases? I think you have to look in terms of what business we are in, what industry we are in. It is not a, it is generic. Uh, you cannot say that, oh, let's all of us put the data together, uh, right? There are, uh, if we look at healthcare data, nobody wants their their uh, their private information out there. Uh, but even though the pharmacies have it, the uh, the doctors have it, the labs have it, but nobody wants to put that data out. Uh, whether it gets breached, that's a different story. But uh, in, pers in pr principle, nobody wants to put that in one place. Same thing happens in energy industry. People have their proprietary stuff and they do not want to share. So there are certain areas. But in certain areas, there is, there is for example, if you are talking about, say, face recognition technology, thanks to the data in the common space, uh, whether through social media or other, your libraries for face recognitions are so large compared to what was 20 years ago when there were only five photos or so, right? So there are certain areas where there is no issue, but then there are certain areas where there is a lot of issues. So you have to be very careful. The central repository is not. In fact, in academic world, people have tried this uh, DS space for uh, research papers and things like that. And so there are, uh, there are some areas people are trying and uh, some, some are valid, some may not be valid. In the medical field, for example, with Mayo Clinic has what they call their data platform. It's uh, run by a physician named Dr. John Halamka, who's been a guest on CXO Talk a few times. They are building a federated data system that enables participating medical centers to if in effect, share their data so that researchers can query those, those data sets about various diseases. It's vaguely similar to what Arsalan is saying, but of course there are protections. Each organization, you're talking HIPAA data. Anyway, so take a look at that if you're interested in this topic. We have one final question from, uh, this is from Roland Coffee on LinkedIn. Anthony, uh, how can the bias from data scientists be removed from the data? Very quickly, because we're out of time. When you set out to remove bias, you almost always introduce some other bias. So 
certain types of bias, like you didn't collect the right amount of data or your data has been manipulated, of course, you want to you want to root that out of the data. But ultimately, the bias that's in the data should be understood and factored into the math that you're using to make analytic decisions. If you try to alter the data beyond normalizing and doing all of the statistical things that we're all taught to do, generally you're introducing some other type of bias that's going to cause some other unintended impact. So my advice would be understand the bias, remove the bias that is what they call random cause variation or assignable cause variation in a way that you you, you know that you it's broken, that you can fix it. And beyond all of that, understand it and consider it analytically in the elasticity of the decision that you're making. Satyam, you're going to get the last word here very quickly. How do we remove bias from the data scientist, from the data and the outcome? First of all, data scientists don't create the bias. Right? Data scientists only look at the data. The bias is in the data. Right? So we it's not, it's about if if the bias is in the data, then we need to understand how it got into the data, whether it was created by somebody, which goes back to Anthony was talking about veracity in the data, or is it something that already happens and we did not understand the physical process behind the data? So that bias is there because something happened, an outlier even happened and it, it exists and could be real, but we didn't interpret it right at that time. Correct. So the as a data scientist, I do not incorporate in, in, put any bias in, into it. Is it possible for a less scrupulous, less careful, less experienced data scientist to introduce bias into the data themselves? Or as Satyam said, these are just completely separate. I mean, bias is a very big thing, right? There's so many di different types of bias. So the, the short answer is yes, of course. I see you shaking your head. No, we're, we might be thinking about different types of bias, right? So, um, you know, the, the question itself has a bias in it, right? That the, 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 the young data scientist or the new data scientist will somehow use, you know, a different methodology. So what I would say very quickly, and I know this isn't quick, is that it, it, human beings always have some type of bias. If we didn't, we would go insane. The number, you're not thinking about how your shoes feel. Now you are, right? You, you, you factor things out all the time. You choose to ignore certain things all the time. It's called living. And so as human beings, when we approach a problem, we bring our humanity into the approach to that problem. We can be as scientific as possible but we will always be, at the end of the day, human beings, not humans doing. And so there will be some type of humanity in that thing that we do. If we're just adding up a bunch of numbers, move on, right? But if we're doing real complex data science and complex systems that are disrupted, that are dynamic, then there is always going to be this element of bias in there. And we must always stop and think about it and pay attention to it. Satyam, you have to finish this off because you're disagreeing here, I can say. There is nothing that we incorporate into it, right? So that's why I'm saying it is no no data scientist can generate can, can create the bias. The bias is in the data. If there could be different models which may say different stories. That's a different. It is telling a story from the data by using certain methods. So either the bias is in the data or in the way your method is. But data scientists themselves do not create create those kind of biases in the story. So Michael, there you have it. There you have it. Two out of two data scientists agree. <laughs> <laughs> two out of two data scientists disagree. Okay. Respectfully, we're, I, I, we're saying different things, but I think we agree with each other. We're in violent agreement. Seems to me you're in fairly violent disagreement. Yeah, no. uh, we're, we're, we're talking about different parts of the elephant here. Okay, and with that, before you guys go, please subscribe to our newsletter. Go to CXOTalk.com, subscribe to our YouTube channel. A huge thank you to Drs. Anthony Scrifignano and Dr. Satyam Priyadarshi. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time to be here with us today. I really am grateful to you both. It was wonderful. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who asked such excellent questions. Don't forget to subscribe to that newsletter so we can notify you of upcoming shows. Thank you so much, everybody. Check out CXOTalk.com. We do have really 
extraordinary shows coming up. Some of the people that are coming up are great. So take care, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.